Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nicole McGrew. She became a master gardener in 2021 and is already doing her second presentation. She's been gardening since childhood and originally from Northern New Jersey. She moved to the area to attend Georgetown and uh, immediately became aware that we have a much longer growing season in Virginia, which she loved. She's a lover of textiles, cut flowers and fresh food. And so this talk really uh, speaks to all her interests. She lives in Alexandria where she grows edibles and ornamentals and is trying her hand at fruit trees. Nicole, thank you. Thanks so much for that nice introduction, Colleen, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for, so much for signing up for this talk. Um, as Colleen mentioned, it is entitled "The Creating a Natural Dye Garden." And you know, when I uh, first was mentioning this talk to folks, um, I think they thought, well, some folks I think thought that it was more about um, funeral gardens and burial gardens, but that is not what this talk is about at all. So let's get started. Um, just a brief outline of what we'll be doing today, um, introduction to what a natural dye garden is. We'll talk about tools and methods, which will be um, a mini primer on how to dye, the types of dye, the materials that you need, the methods, that sort of thing. Uh, but this will not be a dye specific class. It'll just be some background on how to dye. And then uh, we'll take some questions on that. And then we'll get into the meat of it, um, which will really be about the plants that you use to create a natural dye garden. And that's broken up into ornamental and edible plants. We'll take questions there, and then I'll provide some additional resources, and then we'll wrap up with some final questions. Okay, so what's a natural dye garden anyway, right? Uh, a natural dye garden is just a garden that you can create with plants that you will then use to create natural dyes. So natural dyes are colors and pigments that are derived from plants and minerals. They were used for hundreds of years prior to the 1800s when synthetic dyes were first introduced. Uh, some of the reasoning for the synthetic dyes is that the, the color is more consistent, it's usually longer lasting, um, it's shelf stable, um, a lot of commercial reasons. But some of the benefits of natural dyes are um, if you have a skin condition, say, like I know a few folks with eczema who just say that's the synthetic dye, excuse me, really irritate their skin. Um, it's just, it feels better on their skin. It's, it doesn't have toxic chemicals in it. And there um, really is a sort of granularity to the color that is different than with synthetic dyes. So in addition to just being a fun, natural thing to do, there are some other like actual real benefits, some tangible benefits to using natural dyes. Now, certain plants like matter have been used for centuries because of their reliability. Matter, um, indigo, I think these are the ones that we know are more familiar with, and they've been used and have a consistently true hue that people have used for a long time. Other plants we use because they're nearby, they're convenient, we have an abundance of them, and that's okay. You don't have to use the tried and true always colors. You can use what's on hand. I mean, that's one of the takeaways I hope we get from this is that there's no right or wrong way to be a natural dyer. Um, as long as your focus is on using natural plant material, like that's what makes you a natural dyer. There's different processes, different methods, different plants, all of that is fine. And so just when you're, when you're building your natural dye garden, think of it as your botanical palette. That's it. The, the plants that you have in your garden will be your palette for your dyes. Oh, and I should just say briefly here on the right, uh, this is uh, Dyer's Coreopsis, which we'll be talking a bit about later. Um, and just in terms of the variety with botanical dyes, you can get this range of colors from this one flower, depending on how you process it. Okay, so what do you need for botanical dyeing? You need tools, you need a mordant, and you need plants. So let's talk a little bit about each of these things. So tools. <laughs> I know this looks like a long list. Um, don't be scared of it. A lot of these things, um, I know a lot of us may have at our house already. You might have multiples of the glass jars, the mason jars. Um, and these jars, it's not like canning. They don't need to be sterilized. They just need to be clean. 
um, a mortar and a pestle to like to grind leaves or to grind powder, depending on what you're using. Stainless steel pots, um, which I will say uh, you should not use. If you're going to use a pot for dyeing, you shouldn't use it for cooking. Even if these are botanical and natural dyes, you should probably keep them separate. A clothesline to dry pieces outside, tongs to remove um, hot pieces out of a pot, a mesh strainer, depending on the material, say if you're using berries or something, you want to be able to get the pulp and the pieces out before you put the fabrics in. Uh, rubber gloves, a bucket, stainless steel bowls, cheesecloth or muslin, which is just really so that you have a finer type of strainer, wooden spoons, a scale and measuring spoons, a thermometer. Um, you know, normally when you dye, it's at a very high temperature. I mean, high, like it's like boiling water, not, you know, furnace high. And, but depending on how intricate you are and how much you get into it, you might really want to control your heat and you'd need a thermometer just to make sure that you know what heat you're using. Uh, steel wool to clean up afterwards, a whisk uh, to mix some of the things before you create your dye bath. Scissors and pruning shears to collect your plant material. Paper bags uh, to store your plant material. Uh, that's one of the things we'll be talking about is that you don't necessarily need to use your flower or in your plant pieces right away. You can cut them when it's the prime time to, um, to harvest them, but then not necessarily use them right away. And then twine, which has a thousand purposes that you can use for dyeing. So, I mean, it is a long list, but it's pretty basic materials. Um, the picture on the right shows some of the tools that I use. I mean, it's nothing fancy. I reuse a lot of jars that I have in the house already, regular old household, you know, rubber gloves, wooden spoons, twine, scissors. So, you know, nothing, nothing super fancy here. Okay, so um, in addition to tools, one of the things I said you need is a mordant, right? Um, and so what is it? What's a mordant? It comes from the French word mordir, which means to bite. And that's exactly what a mordant does. It bites into the fabric so that the color sticks to the fabric. It's, you know, there's a, there's a word fastness, you know, color fastness. And the mordant helps the, the dye become color fast with the fabric so that it doesn't fade, it doesn't wash out. You get a true color that lasts. Uh, two rather common methods of mordanting are with alum, which is a metallic salt, and with oak galls. You can order both online. Um, you can also collect oak galls yourself, um, but do it later in the season because wasps like to live in them. Um, so you would want to do it in the fall if you're going to do that. Um, but you can, you can order both of these online uh, pretty easily. And then I guess I should say, and with a mordant, Typically, you add it to the, so it's called a dye bath, which is you know, what you put your fabric in to get the color. And some mordants you add beforehand, before you set the fabric in. Sometimes you add them in at the same time. Uh, there's a whole world of mordants um, and like the, what you can put in them. It can, you know, you can really run the gamut and it really can broaden the spectrum of color that you can use. Uh, but again, since we're not, we're focusing more on the plants than the dyeing process, I just wanted to make sure that we talked about what mordants are, gave you some two basic types of mordants um, so that you can get started right away. And then if you like it, you can get into the fancier things. So yes, and then what if you don't want to use mordants? <laughs> because sometimes I know, like when I, when they were first introduced to me, I thought, oh, do I, do I want to add this other element? I have to get all these fancy things. Um, and so, no, you don't have to use them. I mean, it does make the color richer and last longer. Uh, but if you just want to jump in first and see if you like it, you don't have to use them. And so one way to not use mordants and still use botanical dyes is with the bundling method, which you see here. So on the left, these are flowers that I collected. Uh, this is from a workshop I took about a year or so ago. And we have the purple is amaranth. They have a big sunflower in the middle. Uh, cosmos are the little orange little sprinkles there and then eucalyptus on the sides and so you and this is just like a hmm, 20 by 20 white cotton bandana and I rolled it up and then I tied it with twine 
And then I just put it in a pot of hot water um, and let it sit. And so with this class, we were a bit uh, rushed for time near the end. So it couldn't sit as long as I liked in the hot water. I mean, that's one thing that really will control um, or truly determine the richness of the pigment when you're done is how long something can sit in heat. And this was not in as long as I would have liked, but this is what it looked like. And then I'm gonna to try to get out of this for a second, just so you can see what the finished product looked like. And then this is what it was when it was done. Um, the colors are very subtle. I'm not sure how well they show up online, but you can see like in the middle, that's where the sunflower was. And then the eucalyptus along the sides and the rust from the amaranth. And so this was just from bundling, tying, you know, tying it up, soaking it in, in hot water with pressed flowers. And so this is like an easy way to kind of jump into botanical dyeing. If you've tried to, um, if you tried the bundling or don't want to try the bundling and you just want to jump in and really start dyeing, you can start with onion skins. And I suggested onion skins because you don't have to grow these. You know, we usually have onions in the house and we don't use the skins when we're cooking. And so you can just collect onion skins from about 10 onions, just keep them in one of those paper bags. And then when you have enough, you can try this out. Um, and then just a couple of things to think about before you start, you know, don't be afraid to mess up. This is supposed to be fun. It's a natural process. It's not, there's no hard and fast rules. And so just see what happens, you know? Uh, but when you do do it, you should use natural fabrics with natural dyes, hemp, linen, wool, cotton. Synthetics don't do well with natural dyes. They don't have the, the fiber structure is not porous enough to absorb the colors. Um, the natural fibers are, they will, let, they will allow the colors to seep in and saturate the textile and they need to be clean as well. So um, there's a term called scouring fabric, which is really like scrubbing it and getting it ready. It's akin to like sanding wood before you start painting. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that, uh, but just make sure it's clean um, and, and a natural fiber. Uh, use a separate pot. Like I said before, if you're going to use something for dyeing, um, do not bring it back to the kitchen and use it for, kitchen, for cooking, excuse me. And then you just start with onion skins. So you fill your pot with water. Um, I have a big pot that's about 11 and a half by 10 and a half. I mean, this is something, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's something like this size, like a big stock pot. Uh, so you fill it with water at about, add the skins of about 10 onions. And this is, um, you can use yellow onions or red onions, but this is the size I'm talking about is like a medium sized onion. Um, water, boil the water with the skins. And then you'll see a pattern here. Usually the longer something sits in heat, the richer the color. So you just watch it till it reaches the color that you'd like, strain out the skins. And then you can add um, the one tablespoon of aluminum sulfate. Wet your garment before you put it in. That's another big thing. Don't just dump a dry garment into a dye vat. It, it always has to be wet. Um, before you put it in. I'm not really sure why, but I know it needs to be wet before you put it in. And then you leave it in for about an hour. If you think you might want it a little bit richer, you can kind of wash it, wash, wash, wash it, excuse me. Um, if you want it a little bit lighter, maybe pull it out a little bit sooner. I mean, that's the beauty of it. You can be so flexible with this. Uh, let it dry overnight. That's where your clothesline comes in, or if you have a drying rack or something like that, don't put it in the dryer, just kind of let it dry naturally. Um, iron it before rinsing just to kind of help it set. It's like one more layer of heat and then rinse it with fresh water and, and see what you get. Uh, this uh, step is usually for a scarf, but you could probably use it also for like a t-shirt or something. If you wanted something bigger than that, you might need um, additional onion skins. Um, the number the volume of plant material you need will change with the size of the textile that you're trying to dye. Uh, again, that's one of those kind of trial and error play around things to see um, how much you need for something. But um, but yeah, but that's a that's an easy dye project project. Excuse me to start with.
is onion skins. Okay, so let's see if we have um, any questions on, on this part. Um, yes, Nicole, there's okay. just a, one question whether you can use silk or raw silk as a fabric for dyeing. Oh, yes, you can. You know, I only didn't mention them because they're more, they're typically more expensive. And for folks beginning, they might not want to use silks. Um, but both of them are fantastic uh, materials for dyeing. Um, I find raw silk to be a bit more receptive to color. Um, it just seems more open. Uh, I mean, I guess it goes back to like the porosity of the fabric, uh, but and the colors seem a bit richer, but definitely you can use um, either of those for natural dyes, yeah. Okay, and another question, where do you get the aluminum sulfate? Oh, well, there's different um, craft websites where you can, you can get them. You can get stuff from Etsy. There's a lot of suppliers there, um, but neither of them are hard to find. Okay, that's good on the questions. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so now I guess let's get to the heart of it, which is uh, what plant should I plant for my dye garden, right? And then because so much of this is based on your personal preference, uh, what, it, what grows easily around you, what colors you like, the short answer is whatever you like, right? <laughs> Uh, but the long answer is here are some good ones to try. Here are some uh, suggested plants that do very well, um, that grow well here and uh, are reliable color providers. So uh, first one are, so again, I divided this into ornamental and edibles. And so the first round from the edible side are cosmos, uh, sunflower and amaranth. And the way I have this broken up, it's the plant, it's the color that you can get from that plant, and then it's the part of the plant that you need for the dye. So Cosmos, you know, they, be, they come in a range of color, and that means that if you use them for dye, you can get a range of color, just depending on the, the color of the, of the plant material. And for Cosmos, you take the petals and you create a dye bath with the petals, which is just putting the petals in hot water and, and steeping them essentially like with the onion skins, that's creating the dye bath. With sunflowers, uh, the, you usually get green and you take the heads and you can just like lob off the head and just take that whole thing. Uh, there is a specific sunflower called the Hopi sunflower where if you use the seeds, you get a really nice rich black and uh, it's a nice consistent black. Um, but as far as I can tell, it's only with the Hopi sunflower that you can do that. And then amaranth is another color that you can use. Um, you'll get magenta. It's very true to um, the flower head that you see here on the bottom in the middle. And you know, it's a combination of the petals. They, they, um, they fall off really easily when you're handling them anyway. And so they kind of just will fall, fall out. Um, if you noticed a few slides back with the bandana, they're just kind of scattered all over the place. And this picture here on the bottom right, that is um, a basket that I put together. That's the basket actually I put together when I was making um, this bandana here. So you can see the, um, there's actually some yarrow in there as well. You can see the amaranth, uh, the yarrow, um, and um, you can just, get a range from, from these different colors. Some other ornamentals to try are Dyer's Coryopsis um, and Rudbeckia. Uh, Dyer's Coryopsis, it's also Threadleaf Coryopsis, you get an ochre, that's like the, the, the most common color that you will get from it, and you use the flowers. And same thing with uh, Rudbeckia, you'll get like a putty brown and you use the flowers. And what's really great about using these two is that they're native here and they're pollinators, right? And so you get this sort of win-win setup where it's a pollinator garden, but it's also a dye garden. And you, since you cut the flowers to use them, it's almost akin to deadheading. I mean, you don't wait till the flowers are really that far gone. So it's a little bit earlier than when you would traditionally deadhead but you are encouraging more blooms by cutting the flowers. And so you have this situation where you have a pollinator garden, you're kind of deadheading uh, so that you have dye material, 
and then you're encouraging more blooms. And because you know uh, threadleaf or coreopsis and udvecchia, they're perennials, they bloom for a long time here. And so these are really nice um, staples to have in your, in a garden in general, but in a dyer's garden, because you will have consistent material and have consistent uh, source of food for pollinators. And you can store them in a paper bag um, if you don't want to use them all right away, because when you create the bath, you'll be putting them into water. I mean, you don't want to wait till they're like super brittle and like about to turn to dust, but uh, you don't have to use them right away because when you put them in the water, you're sort of helping to revive them a bit. Um, and you might, you might need to let them steep a little bit longer, either let the bath sit longer to get the color you need or have the fabric sit in the bath longer to, re to get the color that you need, but you don't have to use them right away. Some other ornamental flowers that you can use are dahlias. Um, the dahlias on the left, I just, they're actually from a store bouquet, but then I use them afterwards for something. Um, or marigolds, uh, these are from my garden. And um, you know, marigolds grow very easily here as well. And you can do a lot with marigolds. They really have a range depending on the mordant that you use. Um, but in traditional, it's, it's a, like a nice rich yellow. You use the flower heads, um, same with the dahlias. It really ranges because dahlias range, right? I mean, they range in terms of color. They range in terms of the size of the petal, the size of the flower head. Um, and so it really ranges just from yellow to plum, depending on what you're using with it. And then just one little side note, and I have to admit, I've never tried this, but I've read about it in a few different places um, with ivy. I mean, you can make green with ivy, which makes sense um, because it's so green, um, from the leaves and the berries. And I know for a lot of us, it's really like the bane of our existence and we're always trying to get rid of it. So this could be one way to get rid of it um, is to create huge vats of dye, <laughs> of dye with it and have all sorts of green textiles floating around. And then indigo. I wanted to, I pulled indigo out in particular because it's one of those colors that I think and one of those plants that a lot of us know about. Um, we know it for the indigo hue uh, that, I mean, it, it's so synonymous with it. That, I mean, the, the plant and the color have the same name, right? So uh, just taking a moment uh, to, to talk about it and sort of, and, and just all the different aspects of it. So with indigo, you can get light green to dark blue, and that sort of depends on the age of the dye bath. When you use indigo, um, you use the stems and the stalks. And like I mentioned, the color depends on how long it sits. It's usually two weeks to one month, although you can use it more. You can use it sooner than that, but it'll, you'll get a much lighter color. What's shown here is Japanese indigo, which is Procaria tinctoria. And this one easily grows from cuttings. Um, yeah, something I should have mentioned before, I'm sorry, is with um, Coreopsis with Rebecca, you know, you can start those from seed. Um, you can transplant some if, if a friend has a lot um, and they grow very easily here. Uh, marigolds, you know, you can find at nurseries uh, pretty inexpensively. Um, amaranth and cosmos, I mean, those are all sunflowers. You can all start those from seed here. Um, indigo, it's it's harder to find seed. You can you can order some online. Um, there's a vendor on Etsy in particular that I like who has them, um, but they but they also grow really easily from cuttings. One other thing with indigo though is that it's a um, it's an assertive plant. I guess that's the right word. It's not aggressive like mint. Say it's not going to like take over a bed. But it, but it is assertive, and so it's just something to think about if you're going to plant it in your garden. You might want to put it in its own container um, to, to keep it from spreading too much or plant it with something that you know can hold its own against it. Um, I think if you had a number of um, uh, Rubecchia plants there, um, or even, you know, Coreopsis is a pretty hardy grower too. They, they could probably blend together in a bed, um, but it can be just a bit of a grower. And then uh, one other thing to mention too with uh, the, the dye bath and um, keeping it. Uh, this you would keep 
in um, like a plastic, like a painter's bucket, um, like one you get from Ace or something for $5 or like the ones we use just for gardening as well. And just have it sit somewhere, you know, for two weeks to one month, if, if you have a garage or a basement or something, um, cover it just so that no one gets into it or you don't knock it over. And um, that's how I would store it before I was ready, ready to use it. Um, but it's really fascinating in what you can do with it. Uh, these pictures here, this is from another class that I took that was specific to indigo. And um, what you see on the right are um, pieces that the instructor brought with her. And I actually, I have something that I made from that class too. I'm gonna have to uh, switch screens again. Uh, so let's see. Okay. And so this one, so this is another, it was started out as just a white bandana that was dyed in indigo. You can see where the white marks are. That was, um, I tied knots and the knots were to keep the dye from hitting those spaces. And so there's like this pattern throughout of just the blue and then the white where um, it was tied. And this was, I put this in a bath and then um, had it sit and then dry, followed all the steps, line dry, et cetera, in the sun. And, that, and that's how we did that. Okay, um, and so that's indigo. It's a, it's a really pretty plant. You can see the, um, the purple flower heads, which you don't actually need to use. And um, it will come back, it's a perennial. It does, it's not native to here, but it does well here in this environment. And, you know, as a container plant, I, you know, I think it's just a nice addition to have in the garden. And it has this benefit that you, could, you can really create some nice uh, projects with this. And you, the color is so rich that you don't need a mordant. I mean, I would probably still recommend it, but you don't need it because it's just, it's so true, it's so consistent. Um, and it's just, you know, just a, a, a really great plant. And there's a reason why people have been using it for centuries, I guess I should say. Oops. Okay, so let's talk about, um, some of the edibles that you can use uh, for your dye garden. And these are great because similar to with the, with the ornamentals and how we have the ornamentals that pollinators are still attracted to, but we're still benefiting from them. These are plants that we're attracted to that, that we could benefit from and then still use them in this other way, right? So we have onion, you know, traditional onion. Uh, we have rhubarb and we have turmeric here. Um, onion can, you just use the skins and it's just orange, you know, it ranges from orange to purple, um, kind of to quite the range. Uh, we have rhubarb, which you can use the leaves. And it's, it's funny because you see the stems and you think that that's the part that you would use, but you know, the stems are what you eat and then it's the leaves that you use and you get this butter yellow color. And then turmeric, I think, you know, most of us are familiar with that golden color that you can get, um, that you get from the spice. And uh, here you use the, oops, the roots. And so what you do with, two, and this is another one, it's not native here. I would probably put it in a, in a pot and grow it or maybe like a small container or something. Um, you, you dry out the roots and it, you remove the roots, you scrub them and then you dry them out. You can put them in the oven, you can leave them in the sun, you can put them in a dehydrator if you have one, but you don't need a dehydrator. Uh, but once it's dry, then you um, might shave it basically. And then that's when you, and after you have the shavings, that's when you have your mortar and pestle and you grind it. Because this one you need, you need a powder from, from the root basically. And then the powder is what you use as the dye. So it's a bit more intensive, but you know, turmeric seeds, this is how you would also use the seasoning. And so you kind of get this win-win because you'll have fresh turmeric that you can use for coloring, you have it for flavoring. Um, and it's just kind of like a neat little, neat addition, I think. 
Some other edible ideas are berries. Uh, blackberries are the best to use. And for here, you'll get a need a pulp. Um, so basically take a bunch of berries and just grind them all together to create a pulp. And the color, <laughs> I put berry color. I mean, it's, it sort of depends on the berries that you choose, what, what color you will get. And then with beets, you would um, clean them off. You would take off the skin and then chop up the exposed root and then create a bath with that. And you can get some really pretty colors from beets from this really beautiful, um, light rose to a really, really rich magenta, uh, just depending on how long the bath sits uh, and then how long your fabric is in there and then, and then what you're using for your fabric. And then other edible ideas are carrots. Um, you'll get yellow and you use the plant tops and then you have the um, these red onions here, which you get yellow to green, and like with regular or you know yellow onions or sweet onions, you use the skins. And you can get, I mean, the tops are these are carrots I grew last year, and um, you know there's just there's so much plant material in the top, so it's fun to be able to use them for something else. Uh, and then I wanted to take a minute to talk about matter as well. Uh, this is in the coffee family, which is why I included it under edibles, although I don't think any of us are eating this anytime soon. Um, this is not native here, uh, but it does, it can grow here in this, in, in our zone, and it's a perennial. You can start it from seed indoors and plant it outside. Um, and it, it just, but it takes a while, but that's the thing with matter. So it gives you this very traditional uh, red color, you can, it runs the range as you can see here from these really soft sort of mauve colors to like this deep russet, right? And the color comes from the roots. And it's been, it's a consistent, it's like indigo. It's one of those colors that's consistently been used. It's been used for centuries, but unlike indigo, you have to use the roots and it takes longer to set up. The roots have to be at least two years old um, before you can start harvesting them for dye. Um, and so it's just something to keep in mind if you're going to plant it, that this takes a longer period before you can use it. Um, and you have to, because it takes so long, you're not going to want to cut all of it at the same time. So just think about that when you're planting it and think about that when you're harvesting it. It's not a hard plant to grow. It's just that if you're going to use it for dye, there are these other considerations to think about. Um, and that reminds me, I'm, I'm sorry, just with indigo, one thing I should have mentioned is that you should harvest that in August. That's the best time to cut it if you're going to use it for dye. With matter, you also harvest it. Well, you harvest it a little bit later, it's more in the fall, but it's just that you have to wait before you can actually use them. And so you can either do, you can have sort of multiple multiple um, areas where in that way you can kind of pull from one from one year and then pull from one from the other. That way they're always kind of alternating um, or just not take as much if, you're, if you only have it in one spot. It's a beautiful color and it's really great to use um, it just takes um, some planning if, if you're if you're going to use it. Okay, so do we have uh, questions on that part? <laughs> Indeed, we do. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions about caring for the dyed fabric. Can you um, wash it in a washing machine? Do you have to wash it by hand? Will it fade over time? Okay, so. I, I think in part, it depends on what, what color you use. I think the safest answer is that the first time I washed, the first time I washed, I would wash something that's been dyed this way, I would probably wash it by hand. Um, but after that initial washing, I mean, you can look, you'll, you can see when you're washing it by hand, whether it runs or not. And so that'll let you know if it's safe to wash in the machine afterwards. Um, but I, I think to be safe, I would wash them by hand the first time and, and take it from there. And I, what about, does it fade over time? Sure, well, that's part of the reason that you use the mordant. Um, and so if you use a mordant and have the color really set properly, then it shouldn't 
fade any differently than other fabrics fade. I mean, most fabrics fade over time. So it should have the same rate of fade as anything else. If you don't use a mordant, then there probably will be some fading, but it won't disappear. It just might not be as vivid as the initial, initial appearance immediately post dyeing. Okay. Um, there was a question about, uh, do you have any guidance on how to get sort of different patterns in the fabric or oh, sure. are there places for someone to look? Oh yeah, so in the next section, I actually have some books um, and websites that go into that in more detail, but um, depends on what you're, uh, what you're making, um, wh how you would do the pattern. So like things that are really simple, like bandanas and t-shirts, you can do ties, you can take, um, if you can't tie it in a knot, you can take uh, clips or rubber bands to like block off those fabrics. You can do things like, um, you know, if you take Osage oranges, that's another thing. That's another locally available native plant. But I mean, we don't plant Osage orange trees here, which is why I didn't have it as part of the garden, but they're available. So you can take the fruit of an Osage orange and kind of like block print with them. Oh. Um, and so that's another thing you can do, or you can create block prints with, if you have a dye bath and you can take block prints and, and do those on your fabric. So there's, there's lots of different things. Um, and I think the resources that I show in the next section will, will provide more ideas um, for the questioner. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, there was a question about whether you can use native or false indigo instead of the Japanese indigo. Uh, you won't get you won't get the the color, um, which I think is why it's called false indigo. Um, you you should really use Japanese indigo for it. Okay, and someone asks if you can use commercial turmeric powder to to dye. Uh, you could. It just seems more like an expensive way to do it. Um, but you could, yes. Okay, and someone else commented they thought that uh, salt was used to help in the dyeing process sometimes to prevent fading or? Yes, that's that, true. You okay. can use, so yeah, there's all sorts of things that you can use as mordants. I mean, it really is like a whole sort of rabbit hole that you can go down. You can use vinegar, like um, for the beets that I showed, you can use beets as a more, excuse me, you can use vinegar as a mordant for beets. Oh. Um, and so different, different substances can be used depending on the, the plant material and what you're trying to accomplish. So yes, salt can be used for some things. Vinegar can be used. There's, there's, there, there's iron baths that can be created for mordants. So there are lots of different options. I just, because there's so many options and because I wanted to talk more about the plant, I just didn't go into that whole thing. But yes, the, the person, she's right. You can't, or he is right. You can use salt for some things. Okay. And someone else just commented that they used uh, pokeweed berries and got a very oh, nice dye. That is a great use of pokeweed <laughs> berries. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> that really is because yeah, they're very rich. They're dark. They're here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no one buys them. I mean, you're, they're just floating around. So that <laughs> Or grows them on purpose. <laughs> yeah. That's an excellent suggestion. And then what's nice about that is then because blackberries are so precious, anybody who grows blackberries, you're in a, you're in a competition with the squirrels to get to them first. So, um, you know, yeah. no one's really competing for pokeberries. So that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. All righty. That's it for the questions for now. Okay. Okay. And so this goes uh, to your other question about um, where other tools that you can use for, for sources for patterns and that sort of thing. Um, so one of the books that I used here, it's this one, um, Wild Dyer, which I know it's right there on the screen. This one is great because it has a lot of information on starting the plants and like actually building a garden as well as project, projects, excuse me. Um, I'm not sure how many folks here are sewers as well, but there's a lot of sewing products, projects, excuse me, and that book as well. But it's nice because it spends a lot of time on the plants themselves and, um, and the mordant bath. So in terms of you know, using what with what and that sort of thing. Another helpful book is Botanical Inks, this one. This one really gets into the mordant bath discussion. So if you want to talk about, you know, salt or iron, vinegar, um, 
all these different types of bats that you can create. Uh, this one goes into a lot of detail about um, the dyeing process itself. It doesn't really talk about the plants. It just talks about the dyes and how to use them and how to create things. And then this third one here, fiber shed, and this is something I didn't talk about too much in, in here, but I'll, I'll mention it now. This one talks more about plant fibers and textiles more broadly. So there's a conversation about dyeing, but it's more a conversation about the underlying fabrics than the natural fabrics that we're talking about. And so, you know, one of the things I'm growing in addition to the plants that we talked about is flax. I have, you know, little flax seedlings right here growing. Um, they have a beautiful blue flower. Um, and you use flax to make linen. I'm not weaving linen. I'm not, you know, that crazy. Um, but, but it's an interesting discussion about thinking about where a complete garment comes from and thinking about the plant fibers that go into it for, for the actual textile, as well as the plant fabrics that go into it for the dye. And how can we think about creating fabrics that are made wholly within a certain footprint? So, similar to the idea of a watershed and a watershed being this one type of ecological space, how can we think about a fiber shed and our, our textiles and creating them in this sort of one ecological space? And so there's one here, the one in Virginia is called the Chesapeake Fiber Shed, um, but it's really focused on growing dyes and growing textiles that are within, basically within the state of Virginia. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. But um, so these all have lot different aspects of information, depending on what you're interested in. If you're interested in the garden aspect mostly, then Walt Dyer is great. If you're interested in the ink process specifically and like the, the different dyeing processes and methods, then botanical inks is great. And if you're interested in the like textiles more broadly along with dyeing, then fiber shed is great. And then this is specific to indigo. This is a, this is these are more pictures from the workshop I took um, last year. You can see Rosa's hand here with all the dye, and she's holding this amaranth. Um, so Rosa Chang is um, at MICA, and she has these two different websites: the Indigo Shade Map and the Rosa Full Garden. Uh, indigo Shade Map is all about indigo. Um, and is a great resource about the different shades, uh, the ages of the dye baths, all the different things you can do with indigo. You can see here, these are all pieces that she created with different patterns. Um, she's just a really skilled artist. And so it, it's just great to see all the different things you can do there. And then on the right, this is, this is a combination of plants. This is the um, bundling pieces, but you can also see just some of the tools that she has here, has here as well, like the painter's bucket on the bottom, the pot, you can see she has some dry dyes that she uses as well. And so just seeing that, you know, again, none of this is really fancy um, stuff. A lot of it is, is tools that are pretty easily accessible. And it's really just a matter of, you know, diving in and having fun with it. Um, one, I know someone else asked about silk earlier. The scarf that's being dyed here is actually a silk scarf. Um, I don't have a picture of the final product, but I do know that it's silk. And so, yes, I mean, you definitely can use silk with these natural dyes. And this actually, this was a bundling project. So this one didn't even use a mordant. It's just the flowers tied up together and put into basically a bath of hot water to sit. And then um, this is some. This is a group from the UK, and you know I know that we don't grow necessarily the same things as they do in the UK, but some there is some overlap. And I do think that for a dye garden, not all of it. Um, that you, it's always going to be a mix of natives, and I you know hopefully it's predominantly native. But you know like indigo is not native here, so you might have a mix of different plants. Um, and this site I thought was really cool because they um, show you different colors from different things and also on different fabrics. And so if you use marigold, say, uh, even if it's prepared the same way, it's going to look different on linen 
versus cotton versus silk versus hemp. Um, and so I thought that this guide was just another neat way for people to see what the different things are. And then I also thought this one was helpful. I mean, all of the books have pictures of the plants, but sometimes if you're trying, if you're just outside and you're trying to figure out what to use, I, I thought that this scene, this, this site was, uh, was helpful. Were there questions, Colleen, on um, more of the techniques and guides through this section? Um, someone had commented on whether there were differences when you dye yarn because there oh. was anything to comment on. And then you showed these beautiful pictures of yarn. <laughs> sure, yes. So I don't know um, if you want to expand on that at all or. <laughs> yes, yeah, you can definitely, I mean, wool is it's considered another natural fiber and wool is definitely porous enough to take in color. I've never dyed wool myself, but I know that it's, it's, it's one of the easier ones to do because it's so absorbent. Um, and so if you have, access to just plain undyed wool and want to have fun with it you can definitely do so many things with it yes as you can see <laughs> as you can see here it's a really it's a really fun fabric I am um, I can I can sew but I'm not a good knitter so I don't I don't have a lot of yarn experience um, but yes you can definitely dye with yarn and you can you know wool probably is the easiest to work with in terms of dyeing but you know I know that there is silk yarn there's cotton yarn um, you know, yarn comes in all sorts of, of textiles itself, um, and most of them should be um, amenable to natural dyeing because the bulk of them, I, I'm, I'm sure there's some synthetic yarn out there, but I think most knitters, I mean, I guess with acrylic yarn, you probably couldn't do it, right, because that's a synthetic, but if it's yarn that's from a natural fiber, then it should work. Okay, yeah, yeah that's it for the questions. Okay. All right. Well, that's I, I, I finished sooner than I thought I would. Um, so sorry, although I guess everyone's probably busy, too. Um, but uh, this is just information on Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia in general. Um, you can go to our website at mgnv.org and you can learn about um, our different programs, different resources for gardeners, um, our help desk. And you can also learn about becoming a Master Gardener if you are interested. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. If there's no more questions. Thanks so much, Nicole. This was a great presentation and you're so articulate and well spoken. I think you're a natural for these. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Colleen. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks. Uh, and have a great uh, weekend, everyone. Tell you, someone commented on the Navajo uh, dyeing and demonstrating which plants uh, they come from because uh, Nicole and I had had an exchange about that. But anyway, thank you. Thanks. And this was a wonderful um, variation on Master Gardener themes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. All righty, see ya. Bye-bye. Okay,